Hi everybody, it's Andy from Snow Camps Europe here with another Sunday Ski Cast. So tonight I'm still talking to Dave Burrows of Snow Pros Ski School in Switzerland. He is also the man behind the Ski Instructor podcast. Don't forget you can ask Dave questions in the comments whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. If you are watching on Facebook, then don't forget to host a watch party by clicking the watch party button just below. And don't forget to hit the like button, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you are watching on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, you can also ask questions in the comments on YouTube, and we will see them appear here. Um, any questions for Dave, then just pop them in, and we will bring them onto the screen. We have already got some pre-questions that have been sent in over the past week, so thank you for that. Now, before I bring Dave on, just a quick update here from Caprun. Um, as you would have seen a few places, Andorra, Switzerland have had snow. We are expecting 16 centimeters tomorrow and then another 10 on Tuesday, which is fantastic news for the glacier. Obviously, the more snow we get now, um, the sooner the glacier will open and the glacier is set to open. I think it's around the 7th or 8th of October. So the more snow now, the better, the earlier the start. So welcome to those of you who have already tuned in. Don't forget to hit the like button. And here comes Dave. Hello, Dave. Hello, how are you? How are you? I'm good, thanks. Oh, we've got some comments already. So, Dave, you're sat in Switzerland. I am. It snowed. It snowed. How much did it snow? Um, I don't really know because it's up some big mountains up there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I think judging by where it snowed down to, it's down to about 2,000, 2,200 meters maybe. Good something thing. like that and um yeah it's good you know there's been loads of pictures on social media isn't there of, of kind of uh of, of you know snowy pics for the yeah. end of august it's brilliant you know it's uh, i wouldn't I mind being somewhere like sasfe or zermatt tomorrow because it's due to be nice this week as well i reckon they're gonna have a really good day so they're, still, they're still open they're still open are they zermatt doesn't doesn't shut it's a huh. it's an all year round i think it's a bit like um uh, yeah, and Sasfe has a little pause, so they shut mid April and they open up again in mid July. Okay, cool. Sasfe is my local one. We were expecting, I think it said down to 2,400, but quite often yeah. or not, it always falls a little bit lower. Um, not normally higher, but lower. So we will wait and see. Anyway, we've Good. got questions, we've got questions that have been sent in. We've got a couple of people already. Uh, with a couple of comments for us. Hi, guys from Belfast. That's Carl Meredith. Hello. Hello, Carl. So Carl has previously been a ski teacher in Kitzbühel. And Nikki, hi, guys. Welcome to our barbecue. Ah, you're having a barbecue, Nikki. Good stuff. You, There's um, no chance that you would have a barbecue outside now here. It's freezing. It's like uh, she's seven in, degrees outside. She's in sunny Swindon, mate. She's in sunny oh, Swindon. Fair enough. <laughs> Cool. I've expected a question from uh, your your team, Nikki, or a question or two. Uh, so Nikki's daughter and son are both uh, ski and board instructors. All right. Good stuff. Okay, so let's get into it. First question for you. Um, and this has been sent in by Johnny. Hello, Johnny, if you're watching. Okay. Um, and Johnny is asking, what, what did you do before you opened a ski school? Because obviously you own your own ski school in Switzerland. But uh, I guess you didn't do that from the age of 16, eh? No, I didn't. Um, huh. I left school at 18 and I went to work at Barclays Bank in the city of London and uh, a few other banks sort of subsequent to that. So I ended up working at JP Morgan was probably the, the name that a lot of people will know, Bank of New York, City Bank, in the Eurobonds market. And then I sort of did a segue into commercial finance, um, commercial finance brokerage, ran my own company in that sector and then that sort of all came to a grinding halt when um the 2008 credit crisis happened mm -hmm. and um i decided really it's not that necessarily that our business or our brokerage failed because we had a sort of commercial property agency we had uh brokerage and insurance broker like it was you know going really well but it just wasn't fun anymore and um and by that time i think me you know in that climate it just wasn't it's it wasn't a nice place to be really um and so me and my business partner said one day you know look man i've had enough and uh i still see steve all the time actually but um 
I uh, yeah, he he wasn't really you know he went on to set set his set up his own um, life and uh, sort of uh, what would you call it investment advice brokerage. Uh, he's still doing that to this day. Um, and I went in a very very different direction, and I ended up out here. So that was two thousand and. That was in 2000, and so I qualified with my first ski instructor exams in the summer of 2009 in okay. Saturday, and I've been out here ever since. Okay, and that was what, Basie Level 1, 2? I did a, a summer gap, so I did a Basie Level 1 and 2 Okay. in, in nine weeks in Sass Fay, which is enough to drive anyone crazy if you spent nine weeks in Sass Fay straight. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then started hunting around and looking around for people that would would um would give me a job so yeah okay so then you you obviously went because you could you didn't just open a ski school with a basic level two qualification you went and worked for another ski school yeah well it's funny you should say that because there is no there's no reason why you couldn't in switzerland open a ski school with a basic level two qualification in fact you don't need any kind of ski qualification to open a ski school this is all stuff that I found out subsequently. Okay. So if you wanted to, uh, Andy, you could open a ski school in, in Switzerland. Um, in fact, you know, Nikki from Swindon could if, if she wanted to. The only thing that you need to do is to have a, uh, someone within your company that has got the right ski qualification okay. and also has um, residency here in Switzerland of some description. Okay. So there's a different levels of permits. You can't do it with a short term permit, but you can do it with a sort of medium term permit. And uh, and so you, you could if you wanted to. Theoretically, it's possible. OK, that's very interesting. So well, you, you went and worked for a ski school and progressed up to level. Well, then it was a bit of um, a bit of sideways jump because I was looking at the the Bayesi system and I, I got all the way to about what would you call it, like three and a half. So it was halfway through my level three, no, no, level four. Yep. Um, and then I looked really hard at the Bayesi system and I was like, well, this is all geared towards France, right? The whole of the, you know, as well as I do, I think that everything's geared to, to kind of the, you know, the golden sort of pot at the end is, you know, you could go and work in France and be one of the, you know, the guys that work over there. And I never wanted to do that. I always wanted to be in Switzerland. So I transitioned over into the Swiss snow sports um, system. Um, so I'm now fully qualified um, to Breve Federal level here in Switzerland, which is the highest um, level of instruction that you can get over here. I still hold my basic qualification just as a, like, just just because. Um, but but I, to be honest, it's it's not really. Um, the main thing that, that that is relevant to me and my my operation anymore. Okay, and and that kind of the Swiss qualification. Um, did you have to speak French for that, or Swiss? Yeah, yeah, you do. Um, so you have to go and sit all your exams in French. Um, I had to spend well, yeah, and then the final exam, so the Brevet Federal, you have to pretty much know all of their textbooks inside and out. And I spent a lot of time sort of translating it into english and then back into french so i knew that what i'd be talking about yeah. um and then you have to go and stand in front of a panel and they ask you random questions on six or uh, six or so different topics um incredibly detailed stuff you know um all in french and you know about certain sort of set scenarios as well plus you also have to write um a dissertation on a topic of your your choosing in french um mm -hmm. And then you have to go and defend that dissertation in front of a panel of experts. Um, wow. Yeah, where you go. So I'd say as as kind of I'm not a particularly academically minded person, um, but it, and in terms of kind of achievements, it's one that I'm really really proud of because it was probably the most difficult thing that I've ever studied for for sure. Yeah, I bet, I bet it wasn't easy. And did you speak much French before you got there? I had um, when I left. I had sort of a well. So I had GCSE French. Uh, I spoke a bit of French, but not, you know, didn't use it at all. Okay. Um, before I came out of here as part of my plan to kind of make the most of that initial season, I did a 14-week, like, what do you call it, like night classes or something, you know, yeah, at a local yeah. university. Before I left. Yeah, night school. Um, and that was cool, picked up some stuff there. But the most of it for the last 
10 years or so was just me kind of getting myself into situations and, and learning, you know, on the go, really. Yeah. Um, there's a really good co- uh, podcast um, called Coffee Break French, which I used a lot. You know, if you spend a lot of time in the car, you can kind of pick up quite a lot of language by, by listening to something like that every day. Good stuff. Cool. Okay. Well, we went, we went off, we went off tangent a little bit there, but that was good stuff. It was quite interesting. I didn't know any of that about the Swiss system. So that's an eye opener for me. Um, and one of the other questions was kind of follows on from what you just said, but why Switzerland and not France? Cause again, obviously a lot of the Bayesy boys, as mm. I like to refer them to, that it's, yeah. it's beeline to France for, I don't understand what reason, but they do. No. Well, I, I never have either really. And I don't, I, I just don't get it because I think maybe there was once upon a time where you could earn quite a lot of money in France. Um, and, the, and to be fair, there are guys that still do. You know, they chug away. They do 600 hours a season and, uh, you know, 50 euros an hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, and they live on the beach the rest of the time. Um, but I always looked, I, you know, I've been working over here. I saw the kind of clients that we get over here. You know, Switzerland really attracts like a, a really high quality of, of tourists, I think. Mm-hmm. Um and from a sort of ease of doing business point of view and from an ease of kind of living point of view, you know, the bureaucracy here is much less. It's kind of pro-business kind of place. Yeah. Um, for me, I found it quite easy. You know, it's just a, it's just an easy choice. The scenery's better. Food's better. Road's better. Like, everything's just better. I love it over here. Um, and probably the, the final thing that swayed it for me was that obviously how I'm, I'm married to a Swiss um and my kid is swiss so it makes absolutely zero sense to me for be to be interested in france at all um but yeah for, for me i just i just love this place i love it and i've i've actually applied for my i just sent off all my papers for my nationality so um so i see my long-term future here in switzerland for sure cool so were you married before you went over there or before uh i was so um i was married when i went to switzerland that particular marriage was a casualty of uh of, of moving to to uh moving out here um and then yeah, i'm on to kind of marriage number two now oh, okay, my, cool. uh, current, current okay. wife and now just going back to getting the swiss uh nice uh the you filled out the papers to become swiss basically yeah when when you get the the when you get the the uh, what is it? What would it be called? The the status. Yeah. Do they, do they have like a little, do they have a welcoming ceremony? Yeah, I think so. So look, I mean, there's 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 yet another um, big test to do. I don't know whether it's as, will be as hard as the the Swiss kind of brevet federal test. I, I sincerely hope not. But I've just picked up the book that you kind of have to learn. You know, you you've got to know everything really is if you were born here and you would sort of know so you know policeman comes around to your house interviews you you know like it's it's a it's a pretty serious process and um yeah i don't know i'm i'm, I'm going to read that book digest it you know work out how everything works here the thing is that they're, they're asking for in, in a lot of cases you know they might ask you how what's the makeup of the i don't know the, the grand council in switzerland or how many you know councillors are there in the valets and i don't know whatever and you you kind of got to know all that stuff um and currently i don't because i'm not that interested in politics okay. um but you know i'll have to you make my it. It in it. It and, and and learn it all right it's just it's just how it is and actually it'll be an interesting process anyway to learn all of this stuff so, okay. so, so um, as well as, well as yeah. that kind of stuff do you need to know all 36 of the tools in the 36 swiss army knife <laughs> no but well maybe maybe the, the bit i'm worried about the most i think um is the the bit when the policeman does come around my house because uh um because your house has got to be you know tidy like a swiss person's house you know I'm doing pretty well, but uh, there's a lot of social pressure around here for, for that kind of thing you know my neighbor's constantly out cutting his grass and it's, when he cuts his i've got to go out and run out and cut mine because you know it's uh you, you know you know what they're like you know yeah. I mean, but I mean, we're well we're here in the the swiss french bit which is considered like a i don't know like it's you know compared to the swiss german bit uh, that's really really you know a lot of rules the, the german of, element as well yeah exactly yeah. so uh so you know we, we, we'll be all right we'll be all right like so i, I just I, i'm kind of interested in the whole thing i want to i see my future here i want to be part of this 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 country 
and so I've got to do what I've got to do to to, yeah, to sure. pass that test. You know, that's up to me. Yeah, cool. Good stuff. So Carl has asked us a question, which I think we've covered a little bit of, but it brings us on to one of our other questions. Mm. So Carl says, Dave, can you tell us about your background in the ski industry? Well, I think I think uh, we just had that covered. But what do you do in the summer uh, for training in Switzerland? Um, so I, I, I guess Carl is referring to ski training. Yeah. So what, are you, what are you doing? Well, I hope so, because I'm, I'm sure as hell not doing any training at the moment. Um, so my, well, so my background in the skiing industry is pretty much as we, as we talked about. Um, I say I worked my way up to somewhere beyond basic level three and three and a bit. And um, like I say, I switched out and then did uh, the Swiss bit. And if anyone's interested in that particular journey, there's a blog out there somewhere and they can contact me directly and I'll, I'll direct them to what my pathway into the Swiss world was. Um, in terms of summer ski, I think if he's talking about ski training, I I start as soon as Sasfe opens. I go to I go there just because I for me skiing is not a natural thing. I only learned when I was fourteen years old. So, um, well, that's an interesting thing in itself because my daughter's growing up now and she's learning how to ski, but she won't know what it was like not to be able to ski. Well, I remember what it was like not to be able to ski, and. Um, so it's not natural for me. So so this year I went to 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 Sasfe. I normally go in July as soon as it opens, get my first turns of the year done. That's when I consider the start of my season. And then I'll ski probably once in August as well. And then September, October, November, December, I sort of view those as my time for skiing. So I get, you know, I'll go maybe one, I'll go twice a month um, in September and October. And then when Sasfe opens down to about the middle station, when you can get about a thousand meters of vertical at that time of year, that's when I'll go more and I'll really start to ramp up my skiing so that I'm skiing well by the time that December hits. Um, that's that's kind of my routine. Um, if he's talking about physical training, I don't really, I don't really do any. So as soon as the ski season stops, I let my body recover for two months, and I normally start again in July. And I'll do, you know, I'll hit the gym a little bit. I'll do so my current training regime. I've got 35 steps that lead from the bottom of my kitchen door up to the garage. Um, and I'm doing some interval sprint training up the, up, up those once a week. Um, and maybe the odd circuit in the back garden and playing football on a Tuesday night with my mates for a couple of hours. But that's the extent of my summer training, to be honest, because I'm on them on skis every day, pretty much in the winter. Mm -hmm. And I just I just don't want to do anything in the summer, to be honest with you. I'm not really I don't really do. I don't, I don't really do much like off snow training. I don't yeah, know, you know. We've we got we got people here that are in the gym every day of the week. It's, and um, it's not me. I can't do yeah. it. I prefer to spend my summer riding motorbikes. And that's that's kind of my thing to do. Mm, cool. There you go, Carl. Hopefully that answered your question. Nikki, I've looked at your question and I don't quite understand half of it. So have a little, little look, Nikki, and um, maybe <laughs> repost it for us. Um, Carl is saying, cool. Thanks, Andy and Dave. Cheers, Carl. Thanks for watching, as always. Um, another one from the pre-sent in. What we got? Um, we talked about the summer. Um, so why did you start ski school? Why did you not just carry on working for a ski school? This is from Trevor. Trevor is a regular. Hello, Trevor. Hopefully you're watching. Um, so yeah, why did you start your own ski school, um, Dave? Um, hi, Trevor. The, the, why did I start my own ski school? The, I come from a family of um, entrepreneurs. So my mother and father work for themselves. They have done for ever um i just don't really uh i don't really take orders very well from other people and if you've got that in you um and you don't want to be that guy in the bar you know that ski instructor in the bar is going oh i could do this better i could do this better you know you guys are rubbish or whatever um you're gonna put your money where your mouth is at some point and that's what i did um there's there's kind of more to it than that. So I was, you know, I was working for for a ski school in Morjan. I'm very very happy. You know, I love still work with those guys. I still send them business and stuff. And um, I, I will never never ever forget the guy that took a chance on me initially to help me get into the industry. Um, thank you, Rolf. But the um, the long and the short of it was is that I didn't just want to work and trade my time for money um, in that way. 
Mm -hmm. And I was essentially running all my clients, my own clients that I brought to the ski school, I was essentially sort of running my own book out of that ski school. And, and it, was, it was a fairly easy decision to take. But at the same time, you know, I was, I, like I say, I still see all these guys on the mountain. It was just, for me, it was just, you know, it's in my nature. So I have to do it. Yeah. I have to, you know, I, I can't, I just, it's just my, my way. Cool. Good stuff. Uh, Mojan, you say, yeah? Yeah. First place I skied. No way. There's so many people say that. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't believe how many people say that. 1981. No way. And then I went back 82. Huh. Yeah. And the weird thing was, we, I was with the school, Hotel Bellevue or Bella Vista, one or the other. And yeah. uh, uh, our school was just outside of Chester, and the ski teacher was called Chester, which was no bizarre. Way. Yeah. Is so first well, place. Bellevue is still there. Huh? Bellevue is still there. Right, okay, cool. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was good. It was really good. It's still there. So. I remember masses and masses of snow, which I'm sure has changed over the years, as everywhere has, but it was it was bonkers. Yeah. Cool, there you go, Trevor. I think you got your answer. Um, we've already done Tracy's. Stefan. Stefan. Oh, we've done this. What level of qualification have you got? So we've we've answered that. Three and a half mm -hmm. Bayesian and then full Swiss certified. Um, okay, so James, I'm guessing James wants a job. Because James is asking, how and where do you recruit your employees? Uh, if I recruit employees, so the last two people that I've taken on, I've taken on through word of mouth. Not sure if I'm supposed to say that because aren't you supposed to? Isn't it? There's probably a law that says I need to advertise it. <laughs> but the guy last year, so I took Ryan on. Uh, Ryan was a recommendation by a guy called Peter Kuehl, who um, is a friend of mine. And this year's one was a recommendation from Phil Smith, who you had on the podcast last week. Uh, on the, Phil, Brown. Uh, Phil Brown, sorry, Phil Brown. Yeah. Um, so this year, Grant's working for us, and he, I'm sort of sharing him with Phil a little bit. So Phil needs him for some race coaching, and I need a ski instructor. So we kind of, uh, he's working for both of us over the season. Um, okay. If if I'm searching wider than that, and I have actually got an advert out at the moment, or I did put an advert out for people in a certain region and if i do i just chuck it on the the, the like the basie groups or the local expat forums to see who's around um, but actually what happens now is that cvs just get sent to me all the time i probably get at the moment one or two a week yeah um the majority of which i can't really do anything but with but i always make a point of replying to those people because i remember what it was like when i was sending out cvs yeah uh i, I literally wrote to every ski school in switzerland and um and like you know i didn't hear back from a lot of them and i don't want to be that guy really when people are writing to me so i always take the time to write back and say look thanks you're not for us necessarily but you know maybe try these other places yeah cool cool and uh, cool. your team predominantly uh english or are they a mixture of no so we've just changed our branding and marketing um so we only now employ native english speakers okay um, mainly to do with how you communicate with what our, what essentially our, our our client base is um and so i only really yeah so i only so now you'd have to be a native native english speaker and secondly you would have to be a certain qualification level in order to be able to come and work for us because i now get so many cvs and there's so many like level three gap course providers so you know how like a few years ago it used to be the level two gap was the one to go on and yeah. people used to go and do that well they then funneled all those guys into level three gaps and so now like the minimum that i'll accept is a level three isia instructor if they're if they're from the british system um i've got a couple of guys that so gradually the level of my ski school is going up i've got a couple of guys who don't have that qualification but they're such amazing teachers that that I'm not that worried about that. Mm -hmm. so, you know. Cool, cool. And is, is your clientele base therefore native English speakers? Mostly, yeah, mostly. Um, and that's kind of our niche because there's a there's a there's a little there's a certain something about communicating someone with someone in your own language, yep. and the nuances that 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 comes out of that. Um, if I'm like a Swiss guy and I've only got sort of one way of saying that particular kind of technical or teaching input um 
I don't have the ability that, that, that you need to somehow explain it two or three different ways, which is often the case when we're teaching people, you know, like they might not get it when you explain it one way, but they might get it when you explain it the other way. And so there's, there's something in language that means that it works really, really well for us to have uh, native English speakers only. Yeah. And that runs through the whole ski school. So the marketing is done by native English speakers, the sales, which is done by me is native English speakers and, and Alicia who runs the back office is also a native English speaker. So whoever you're dealing with at any part of the process, you're going to be dealing with those people in your language. Yeah. Good. Cool. Wicked. 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 Cool. So um, next one from Chris, and we may have touched on this a little bit earlier, but he's basically asking how, how hard is it to open a ski school? Um, in Switzerland. So you said you don't actually need to be a qualified ski teacher, let's say, but how no. hard is it to open the business part? The business is really simple. So Switzerland's quite a pro business country. Um, so what I had to do was to open a ski school, let me think now, I had to go down to something called the Register Commerce, which is like the, the central body that sort of, I don't know, like it, it, it sort of has all the details of all the people who have businesses. Companies go down have. there, tell them what you're looking to do, fill in a form, and you're away. Yeah. And it's literally as simple as that. Assuming that the thing about Switzerland, as long as you've got all the right bits of paperwork. So they say, right, okay, if you're going to start this business, have you got the right level of insurance? So you go to the insurance panel and he gives you the right insurance thing. Have you got, you know, there's a, there's another body that oversees, for example, here in Valais, that oversees the authorization of the ski teachers that they're allowed to teach. So you'd need to prove that you have the right document there. But if you've got the right document, which is the Brevet Federal, they'll stamp it, no problem. Same, you know, so as you go through all of these steps, it's very simple. Um, and it's just a, yeah, it's just a, a kind of making sure you've got all the right forms. And that's what I really like about Switzerland is that it's just, it's quite pro-business. They want you to get going um, and there's no gray areas, you know, as long as you've got all the right bits, uh, right bits of paper, you're away. And, okay. and that's that you know there's no it's not like trying to get anything done in france for example yeah. you know where it's really really difficult and it's not a pro business environment you know that's it's a it's it's complex and bureaucratic here yeah. get the right bits of paper get them stamped you're you're good to go sounds very sounds very different to austria um, <laughs> yeah austria, austria, austria. Austria. that question so what it's like what's it like your end yeah, like, is it it's, bureaucratic or not? It's it's yeah, it's it's quite difficult, and every different area um, has different rules. So right. one one of the one of the kind of the main ones is in Salzburg land, your ski school would have to have an office, and it would have to have a a, a meeting place in Kinderland. Yeah. Where in the Tyrol, you don't have to have an office or a Kinderland. Um, yeah. And it's almost like you want to open a ski school in Salzburg land, but you then have to go and rent an office, rent yeah. some land. And there's loads of other things you have to be able to have, or you have to have, to be able to get a license. Um, yeah. So it's 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 not as easy as what it sounds like it is in uh, in Switzerland for sure. What what was it like to to have to get all the permits and stuff for the 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 summer restaurant thing? That was actually quite easy. Right. Um, that was walked into a similar kind of establishment as you've spoken about there. Showed them the appropriate papers. It's stamped there, and within a week, it's sent to you. Uh, the okay. license is approved. Um, but there are different levels of licenses, depending on what you want to do. And uh, the bigger the license you want, then the more difficult it becomes. But for the license we picked up, it was very, very simple. Um, okay. For those of you who are watching who don't know what Dave's referring to, is we <laughs> ended up opening a restaurant on a mountain for this summer due to coronavirus putting us out of work with our normal summer jobs, which is tour guides. Um, Glad, happy to say it's going extremely well um, and we didn't have to jump through too many hoops, let's say. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was actually quite simple. But there are other things in Austria that aren't so simple. Is that is that because ski instruction is considered like a, a risk activity? Uh, I wouldn't say, I, I, would, I wouldn't, from, from what I know and understand, I wouldn't say it's because it's a, a risk activity. It's because it's skiing and it's Austria okay. um, it needs to be protected. Um, yeah, the, tourism, the tourism element of skiing needs to be protected because it's one of, one of, if not, yeah, one of the biggest tourism earners. And yeah, 
if you want to own a ski school, you have to have this, you have to have that, you have to have a license. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, a, that's a whole show on its own, I think. Okay. A whole show on its own. Hmm. Yeah. So back to our questions. Uh, that, so this follows on with that, uh, how easy is it to open your ski school? What are, the, what are the most difficult things about running a ski school in Switzerland? Oh, that's a good. I had to think about this this question. I think a bit more. Um, what would be that the scheduling is one. So you've got like everyone wants the same slots as you as you probably know, right? From from what you're doing, everyone wants the same slots and. If everyone had the same slots, you'd have 20 teachers all working the same slot. But that's not always possible, you know. So yeah. scheduling is sometimes a bit difficult. And you've got, especially with our ski school model, because we've got different people in different areas. And some people travel between some areas. So you've got to kind of factor in, like, how long it takes to get there um, and where they're going to be in any given time. And often, no, not often, rarely, but it's not well, it's not really me that does it anymore but in the first few years that was difficult trying to work out and then some days you'd see like a like a you know a disastrous thing that you'd booked in where a guy can't be in two places at one time or he can't ski between two locations in 15 minutes um and so that has sometimes proved difficult but now i've sort of outsourced the diary and the booking in stuff so there's a sort of double check that goes on now with me and alicia so that's um that's working pretty well and that kind of eliminates most of the, that that weirdness um the other thing that i find the most difficult about running a ski school is is the month of august actually okay. um i'm there's stuff to do in june sorry when, so the season ends in april there's stuff to do in may stuff to do in june july you're kind of not really doing anything you're okay with that but the month of august when everyone is still away on holidays because we did a lot with kind of international schools and, and international school parents or parents in general, but we really start. To, so tomorrow, um, this next two weeks coming is when I'll now start to approach all of our clients from last year and the year before and say, Hey, we're about to start to open the diary. If you want the slots that you want, you need to kind of start booking them in soon. Um, just because also this year I've got a smaller team as well, because I don't think we're going to have so many, holiday tourists this year yeah. so i've reduced the team a little bit but i'm ready to go like in august i'm i will sell skiing to anyone in august i'm re i'm ready but no one is around to to talk skiing to to talk about the skiing that they want to book in you know like anything like that august is just for me it's just and it goes deadly deadly quiet and it's that month you start it's like being in a sort of a dark quiet room like you start do I still will exist? Happen? Will it happen? You know, like, <laughs> will, still, will all this come back? And I ask myself this every August, but you know, and it always does come back. So I panic less and less as the years go by. But but yeah, August in August and scheduling are like the 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 two things that I don't like the most. Okay, I we 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 uh, I worked for a ski school that had some scheduling issues and it wasn't down to scheduling being difficult it was down to incompetence and um it was down to if somebody booked a lesson it'd be like um can i have a full day private for um wednesday yes you can what's your name john okay john meeting point is the kitchen on glacier then you'd get a phone call uh andy go to the myscogel and meet john and you'd go to the myscogel and you'd be there for 15 minutes and you get a phone call saying where are you your guest is waiting for you it's like i'm at the myscogel you're supposed to be on the kitchen horn. When well, you sent me to the mask. No, we did not. And they would deny that they sent you to the wrong place. And then you'd get to the kitchen horn and John's like gone home, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, lots of crazy scheduling stories can be told from that ski school, I tell you. Um, yeah, we, we've got to be really careful with that because, like you said, we're in different locations and stuff. We've got to make sure, you know, often he's double checking. And often I'll kind of, you know, be there on friday night just making sure that everything's all set for the weekend because it's all so well stacked that there isn't much room for error you know and a couple of things got caught out last year actually which is i wasn't particularly happy with but like for example one of the guys tried you know didn't really check the weather um and instead of driving to one of the resorts which is arguably quicker to get to he decided to ski over yeah. but the lift was shut because it was like high winds so he was he got stuck halfway through halfway between there and there 
So it's not like he was even late. He was just stuck. And um, that then has a knock-on effect with the rest of the day. Yeah, and sure. so that I'm, you know, I'm going to put that in our formation this year. But like, check the flipping weather before you, you know, you decide to ski to work because yeah. it's not always the best option. I know it's the most fun option, but it's not always the best option. And are you when 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 the ski squad is in operation and the guys are out teaching? Are you also out teaching every day, or are you in the office? This year I'll be out teaching more. Last year I kind of I wouldn't say I took a season off, but I only worked a couple of hundred hours, and the rest of the time that I was trying to do trying to get myself to a place where i'm doing what you might call like quality assurance or something mm -hmm. you know where like i in the future i'd really like to be like skiing around the mountain and just mm, keeping an eye on things is the wrong word but like you know skiing up to clients be like hi how you doing i'm doing everything all right you know that kind of thing yeah just to kind of Guess I don't know. I just like the idea of it. And I think it would be really good, you know, and I could kind of just see how it's all going and help out where I could. Yeah. Um, that's probably not going to happen this year because, like I said, I've reduced the team a little bit. So I'm going to probably have to step in and take those hours that the other two guys who aren't coming back have um, yeah, are not sure. going to do. Yeah. I don't mind that just for this year. And then I'll probably, well, I don't know. Once we start sending out these the you know ne next week's marketing i'll probably have a really good idea of what next season's going to look like mm -hmm. and then i can always add someone if i need to yeah, yeah, so yeah. you know as well as i do finding ski instructors is really easy but what i don't want to do is to like take people on with the promise of work mm -hmm. and there not be enough work because that's yeah. a terrible thing to get someone out here for the season to do that yeah. but my idea would be more like you know let's see what demand looks like and then add if we need to yeah if you need to put in to bring someone in bring someone yeah. in. You, you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times dave uh, about uh, operating in different resorts and sarah's question is actually what um no it isn't sarah it's rob rob's question is in which in which resorts uh, do you operate in ah so uh hi rob um so we operate in the following places so we're in the swiss side of the port de soleil so Morjan, you know, um, Champassan, Le Creuset, and Champery. We were operating in Verbier. We occasionally go there for clients if they ask us to. But frankly, they've got enough ski schools in Verbier. Like there's 20 of them. They don't need another one. Um, we also operate in Villa, uh, which is just across the valley. It's not very far away. Um, so you count kind of Villa, Le Diablere um those two places and the other one that we operate out of a fair bit is a place a little tiny place called la doll which is just on the jura so as you come out of geneva and you go past neon you turn left and you go up into the jura mountain range there and there's um there's a ski resort called la doll and that kind of services a lot of the people that ski out of geneva and so um so we operate there as well so that's is how that, is that a relatively small place yeah it's tiny like it's only like I want to say it's not even 50, 60 kilometers of piece, maybe. Okay. Okay. You know, one chairlift, bunch of drag lifts. It's, it's a lovely place and it's kind of got that. So it's not big mountains. It's not Alps Alps. It's kind of pre Alps yeah. and it's sort of rolling hills rather than, you know, it's more like you would look at like Norwegian skiing or, or Scandinavian. Okay. Yeah. Cool. cool. It's really cool. nice. Really nice. Um, so several different places. Um, Sarah who I confuse with Rob. Hello, Sarah. Wants to know, what's your favourite type of student to teach and why? Oh, um, kids, but that, that, well, my favourite type to teach is kids between six and nine years old. You can have great fun with them and they learn like sponges. They're really, really cool. That's that's probably my favorite. I have great times with those guys. Um, the one that I seem to be best at teaching is the sort of uh, lacking confidence middle-aged women group. That's my uh, that's my sweet spot um, in terms of like what I do the most of and what I'm uh, what I'm what I'm good at. I think. And what I do love you put that, what right. you put that down to Dave? Because that that is also one of my. Or as I believe, and one of the things we do at snow camps is very much we we run camps for fearless people, and that's typically middle-aged 
ladies. Um, mm-hmm. But wh- wh- why do you think you're so good at that? Why? How do you get your results? I'm uh, I'm a good listener. I think that's a good one. And I think often, actually, I think the motivation sometimes behind those lessons isn't necessarily wanting to get better at skiing. Um, there is an element of that, but there's an element of social about it as well. Um, and a, a lot of the time, and they won't, you know, some some of these these um, these trailing spouses won't mind me saying this, is that, you know, they'll come, they're sometimes expats to a new new country, and, you know, they just kind of want to get out of the house, you know, stuck with the kids and, and you know, husband or wife is at work all day. And, um, and you know, they, they, this is their kind of moment of, of enjoyment for the day. And I think there's a balance, a balance to that, you know, in between kind of shuttling the kids around and, and you know, their spouse being away on business travel and that kind of stuff. So there's, there's an element of that. Um, you know, I, I, I know my topics really, really well. I think if you've also done any real um, research into your into your works, and we'll we'll probably talk about this. I'd say probably when we do when you come on my podcast is is that um, you know there are certain there's, there's a lot of kind of very female specific stuff that is to do with the way that the female of our species skis, and not a lot of ski instructors know about that kind of stuff. And when you know about that kind of stuff, you can make really, really, really big improvements to um, to female skiing, and you know quite quickly. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to, to to kind of be able to communicate, as well as you know all of the other stuff that we've talked about. Cool, good stuff. Good stuff. There you go, Sarah. That's answered your question, I'm sure. Okay, so let's move on to the podcast because you are the man behind the Ski Instructor Podcast. Um, And as the name uh, kind of alludes to, you therefore have spoken to many, many different ski teachers from around the world. So the first question, and this is from Paul, is why did you start the podcast? I finished the um, I finished the Swiss Brevet Federal, started the ski school. And to a certain extent, right there and then, I'd realized a lot of the dreams that I'd had for the previous decade. And I sort of, I sort of fell off a cliff in terms of um, like learning. So I've been on courses year in, year out for the last kind of 10 years, been learning something or other. And then I sort of looked around and you you go back and have a look at my Facebook. I've I've put posts up. It's like, is anyone teaching anything interesting that isn't bloody Eurotest training, tech training, whatever? I looked around, I looked everywhere and there was nothing. You know, like I put this general shout out and people are like, oh, if you're interested in skiing some gates, I'm not interested in skiing some gates. Teach me something new and interesting. And I couldn't find anything. And so I thought of like, starting some stuff myself i thought about i don't know i thought about running courses and or, or doing things like master classes and stuff i even went as far as contacting like dave riding's agent and asking him if he'd come you know if we could get him to come for a day um and you know just do do things like that and uh and there was i just couldn't get anything going so i th- i thought about one day while i was sitting in the car because at that time there was only there's only like one or two skiing podcasts going around, especially the, there's Tom Gelly's one, which is global skiing, which is the mm-hmm. kind of the real nerdy one. He's and he won't mind me saying that it's like a real, real deep dive into certain stuff. Um, but I kind of wanted to hear like a sort of long format, long format um, discussion, like the like almost like you get with the Joe Rogan podcast. You know that one listen to that one or not i don't know um, I, i'm not i'm not a big podcast listener to, to okay well, I, I'm, so, I'm a lot more, i'm a, much more of a visual person so i like my video hence, okay hence this so, to be fair um yeah. although I, I have listened to some of your podcasts um uh, because you were coming on so i thought it was <laughs> important to do so <laughs> well but, so so you know someone like joe rogan his ones will go like he'll take someone in an interview and interview them for like three hours wow. so you can you know like and it'd just be a chat just like we're having um and i really like that idea of that format um so there, like i say there was tom gelly there was a guy in the us um who i think he stopped his one now um which was called peace off which is a really great name all about ski racing but there was nothing that i kind of wanted to hear 
And so I, I sort of I happened to see that Phil Smith of Snowworks was in Le Crozet. I was like, look, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere, but I want to interview you and let's see. See, see, you know, and I asked a couple of people I knew about how to get a podcast going. And um, and yeah, and I just went and, and recorded him. And we had ended up with an hour and 30 in the can, long chat, just like we're having, you know, shooting the breeze. And it was interesting, and I learned something. I learned many things. And out of all of the interviews that I've done so far, I learned something out of each one, each time. And that's my way of, it's like an ongoing, like, CPD, like a professional development thing for me. Yeah. It's not technical. I kind of learned that. I've got enough good skiers in my in my ski school these days to, to kind of learn something new each time I go out. But from a, a learning from people who have been there and done it that that's what i'm getting out of the podcast and i decided really to to um record it just just and, and actually put it on the the internet or out as a podcast just because like i'm not looking for anything out of it i'm just putting it out there as like a general knowledge body for everybody mm-hmm. not you know it's not for personal gain necessarily and do you do you have uh, certain equipment that you use, or do you just literally record it on your phone, or what do you do? Yeah, yeah. So I stick my phone like this in between the two of us and get and press play, uh, record. Oh, really? And that's it. Now I could probably do it better. I'm considering buying a microphone, maybe. Okay. But generally, the sound comes out okay, um, and I've got some editing software on my laptop, which it allows me to make it louder and take you know some of the background noise out and stuff. Um, but yeah, like I'm considering getting some like lapel mics or something like that. I've, I've seen people like with like microphones and mixing decks, and people going yeah. to like an i an i uh, a podcast studio to record them and all sorts of stuff. So you're just doing it on your phone. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's really? not it's not professional quality, but it's not supposed to be. You know, I'm I'm recording it just for my own posterity, and I happen to release it to the general public just for just in case anyone wants to listen. And, you know, that just in case anyone wants to listen turns out to be like 30,000 downloads plus since it started. Wow. Um, but for me, it's not it's not about that. You know, I just, I'm just, I'm just trying to learn. And if people want to kind of come along that with me and see what okay. they pick up about it, then, then, you know, more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. But I am, like I said, my one concession to this is that I might find, if I can work out how to do it, I might put some lapel mics on there. On, on future guests but some of these are done done over skype right as well oh, not skype um uh messenger uh chat thing okay. so actually that's difficult to get decent sound quality on so when i'm doing those ones i'll have my laptop set up i'll have a pair of speakers sitting here and my phone kind of balanced in between the speakers so it's my voice and their voice yeah 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 it's like it's not a great solution, but it seems to work. And okay, like I say, cool. we tidy it up in the in the the editing software, so it's not a massive deal. Cool. So leading on from that, um, Jamie is asking, uh, you've had many people on the podcast. Uh, who was your favourite? Oh, oh, I don't know. I can't. It's a tough one to say. So um, who, who's been on? I know that you've had um, Terry from Elite Skiing was on. He was, yeah. He um, was. I, hey, yeah. Uh, Bill Smith, it. Jazz Lamb, uh, Tom Gelly's been on. Um, Did you have Julie to get up in the middle of the night? On. Huh? Did you have to get up in the middle of the night for Tom? It wasn't easy. It wasn't no. easy. The time difference was terrible. Like he was doing it at eight in the morning or something, and I was doing it at eight at night or something. It's okay, so it's not too bad. Um, well, who else did we interview? Joe uh, JF. In Who? Canada. JF in Canada? Yeah, yeah, uh, no, not JF. I haven't done him. So Lynn Mill, Josh Foster, I did. Oh, oh Josh Foster from Big Wise. Yeah. He's a really nice guy. Um, yeah, like Tom Waddington, Annie McCann was really interesting. Ed Drake was a real good ed- uh, media guy. Um, Ed, and, uh, Drake, Joe Beer uh, was great Ed Drake is the Ski Sunday guy. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Cool. Um, Joe Beer was a really good interview. I've known Joe for a long time and he was, he was brilliant. Um, and the one that was super interesting was Jim Taylor, who was a uh, psychologist, worked with the US ski team as well. He was he was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Aspen, like, someone from Aspen, you did? 
Jeremy. Yeah, I did. That, that was a bit of a grab, but I'd like to do that one again, actually, um, because that was uh, that was Jonathan Ballou from the Aspen Ski School, yeah. and he was kind of half in his car, half not. Um, got Pete Butler, uh, sorry, Pete Gillespie from the Snow Centre, but the one that was caused, I'm having a look at it now, that one's had over 2,500 downloads, was Simon Butler, the Simon yeah, Butler. Yeah, Simon Butler, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he was a great interview. You know, that was I travelled to Majev for that one. So yeah, some of them I'll go to go to places. Uh, um, Phil, Tom Gelly. Yeah, I mean, there's you know, there's loads. Um, Mark, Mark Little is commenting just faster now. Mark is um, comes skiing with me a couple of times every winter, and we okay. normally sat on the chairlift. And Mark's watched every one of Josh Foster's videos. Hey, and, well. uh, he would literally <laughs> turn around to me and go, "But Josh, Josh Foster says." <laughs> yeah it's true and funnily enough i still use so uh, josh was a great interview really good like a lovely guy and um i i uh i had i i'd also watched you know all of his tips when i was going out so when i was a, an instructor like uh, in my early years and i still use a couple of his tips kind of to this day with clients and stuff you know because they work just so well it's so simple yeah, yeah. my well, favorite one is the elbows down one the elbows down is the is the it's the one that works really well. Uh, no baggage into the off piece. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it's funny because one of the days that Mark had said it, I went home and uh, I was watching Josh Foster videos to prepare for the next day so I could <laughs> put in some Josh Foster uh, comments, knowing Mark would know what they were. Hi, Mark. Yeah. I hope you are all okay up in the Northeast. And uh, we'll see you soon. Um, Mark's saying he's a top guy. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, can't, I can't believe you've not been to ski with him, Mark. <laughs> he's a he's a fireman as well. Like he's the boss of the uh, the fire department where he is. Wow! And that's his main main job, actually. Um, you know, he does he, does, he skis like that for fun. Yes, yeah. extraordinary. But he's got some really cool stuff going on right now. Like he, he's sort of set up his own company and he's all over the place. He's doing a bunch of bunch of stuff in um, in China as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, everyone's going to China, aren't they? Um, Tayton is saying, I'd recommend a Blue Yeti or a Yeti Nano if you want a top-end, low-cost microphone. I'm going to write that down now. Blue Yeti. Well, what I need, actually, you might know this, Tim. So this is my phone. It's an Android phone, and it's got that that socket in the end of it. The new, I think that's USB or whatever that is. And I think I needed. Uh, a thingy that goes in there. So if you know one of those that's got two lapel mics that fits in there, that's what I'm after. But how would the person, if they're in another country, wear a lapel mic? Well, those I'll have to go back to doing. Um, they, I'm talking about for in-person interviews. Ah, okay, mainly. right. So Tate, okay, yeah. Dave wants uh, uh, a one-in, two-out lapel mic. How does he do yes, it? That's exactly it. To fit an Android phone. Tayton, no, no, I, I, I have looked at a blue snowball for this actually, Tayton, to be fair. Um, blue snowball. And yeah, but what I don't want to do is carry around like a separate mic. Right. You know? In November. Yeah, I hope so, Mark. Um, cool. Where were we? That was people you've had on the podcast. Yeah. And how easy is it to do a podcast? Well, you just need to do it with your mobile phone, is what you told me. Um, it is really easy. It's surprisingly easy. The bit that takes time is the editing, but really, I've got that down to about an hour now these days okay now if people want to go and find the podcast yeah. we've put that on one of our banners so if you want to go and listen to any of the ski instructor podcasts that dave is talking about with the people from all over the world so josh foster in canada and then the guy from aspen and australia etc then this is the place to go the ski instructor podcast dot podbean dot com probably find it if you put in the ski instructor podcast into google i expect um who's it, also streams through, um, it also streams through apple podcast so you can find it on there as well apple podcast spotify no you have to i only found that the other day i was going to load it there but you you can't upload onto itunes unless you're uploading aac format and then for spotify they only take mp3 format so okay um, like okay. you need a separate RSS yeah, feed. Right? About changing it. Yeah. So who's coming up? Phil is asking, who do you have coming up? So uh, the the next one. So I just went this week to interview Julian Griffiths from European Snow Sport for a second time. Um, and I did that because we recorded essentially what was a COVID special. So what do you think skiing is going to look like this winter? Mm -hmm. And 
which I'll be interested to know your thoughts on as well. Um, and then I've got one also recorded, pre-recorded, which is with Damien Franson, who was um, who skied at a really good level, but he was on the Swiss Swiss um, demo team. Okay. Uh, he is a hell of a skier and also a lovely guy. And um, so I've got a really good interview with him as well. And the next one I'm trying to do is I'm trying, what I'm trying to do this summer, my focus is to do like skiing culture in different countries. And that's why you're next, actually, Andy, because I want to know about Austrian skiing. Um, I don't know any Austrians, so you're the nearest <laughs> nearest thing I've got to it. Skiing in Lederhosen. Well, yeah, um, that, that's like question one. <laughs> uh, Tayton, sadly no idea about a lapel mic. The Yeti Nano is quite compact and can either isolate sound for one person or around the table. Uh, yeah, because I think it's got one on each. It's a ball and it's got one on each oh, side. Really? Yeah, okay. works with USB, but can get a con USB. Okay. Yeah, the snowball. I looked at snowballs for this, and they're, they're one of them. It does. It's it's a round. It's a snowball, so it's round, yeah. and it has a microphone that comes out of each side, so you could sit opposite each other with it. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Might be worth might be worth looking at, and they're not that expensive either. Uh, what else have we got before we wrap up? Who have you got coming on? We've done James. Uh, how do you recruit your employees? We've already done that one. Uh, okay last last one from here unless we have okay. any more coming in in the comments and this is <laughs> do you offer snowboard lessons and if not why not oh we do offer snowboard lessons but i don't advertise the fact and i don't um i don't teach it personally so I've got two or three really good uh, dual qualified guys on my team um, who, are, who are great at snowboarding, great at teaching it. But um, actually, so there were some stats that come out uh, about a year or two ago from the the red schools in Switzerland who produce, you know, keep all these stats on all the lessons that they, they give. And in Switzerland, I don't know what it's like in Austria, but in Switzerland they said um, – 95% of all ski uh, all lessons taken in Switzerland by red schools were ski. Mm -hmm. Like there is no demand for snowboarding lessons as far as I can see. Certainly that's our experience. So there are, we, we obviously deliver some, but in terms of the total number of hours that we do, it's, it's within that proportion yeah. for us. And I don't know, like we just... Um, we say on our website that we can do it, but I mean, I, we we just don't we, we just don't push it very hard. Um, I don't know whether it's a dying sport or there's just not that much. Like, what I think there is is that there's not that kind of um, you know what you, you have with skiers that they continually kind of want to get better and yep. they're prepared to take lessons to do it. Yep. Snowboarders, I get the impression that once they can turn left and right, they just go yep. and you never see them again. There isn't that kind of um, sort of perfection searching yeah you know they just kind of they sort of work it out as they go along mm -hmm. and um i don't know man it's just it's just how it is that's uh um that's out that's only our experience i think there are resorts in the alps that are quite specialist snowboarding like lax apparently in switzerland has a big snowboarding scene but but certainly yeah. around where we are it's more skiers than it is snowboarders yeah so cool. it's um it's not me being discriminatory <laughs> good still cool uh tate uh no not tate steve is saying austrian ski culture equals the nail game what's the net what I, have i missed something what does the nail, nail, game. You, nail you're game. Asking me about the nail game oh i know what you mean yeah 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 I, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's kind yeah. of I, yes, I think what, what you're game. saying there is austrian ski culture is upright <laughs> well yeah so this is what i was going to ask you right how does that look this year because you're uh, I don't know what app is going to look like now. No, nobody does. Um, we, we're not sure at the moment. We uh, There was a meeting uh, in Vienna last week and the Bergbahn, like the overriding Bergbahn, um, the people who govern the Bergbahn in Austria through mm. the WKO, which is like where you go to get your licenses, um, they put a proposal in that said APRE should be able to go ahead However, with reduced number of people in bars and that the bars should close um, maybe between 6.30 and 7 to be disinfected for everybody to leave 
Um, most people would then probably go and have their dinner. Um, and then if anyone came out for a later session, which wouldn't be strictly apre, but a later party, then the bars would have been reset. They would have been cleaned, disinfected, et cetera, et cetera. That was what they would like to happen. Um, mm -hmm. Whether the government will go with that, we don't know. We are very much expecting um, there won't be any high energy apre. Um, it will be, you can go into bars and sit at tables and have a few drinks and have a laugh with your friends, but there'll be no standing on the tables and on the benches as there normally is in Austria, um, jumping up and down like lunatics, which I fully endorse normally. Um, and there won't be so much like packed into bars and clubs and things. Um, outdoor apre, maybe we are thinking could be a, therefore more um, appealing to people. And there are mm. places with massive big umbrellas and heaters. Um, Crazy Daisies in ZLMZ has a big apre outdoor terrace. Um, so if they are allowed to operate, we're thinking that could be busy. But again, they probably won't be able to have the number of people that they would normally have. Um, do you think? Do you think that this is still going to be? We're we're now just about to go into September, aren't we? Do you still think? Do you think this is still going to be a thing then when we get to like December and January? This whole I, kind of. Okay, so I don't know. How, I don't know how it's in Switzerland, and if you are in a, in like a little village or if you're in a town or what it be, but what's going to happen here? And it's happened already. Literally yeah. yesterday, our car park outside was full at nine o'clock. Everybody has gone home, and now there are about 10 cars in a car park that takes about 150 cars. Yeah. Um, the season, the summer season, is as good as over. Um, obviously, it started late. It always dies at the end of August because the schools yeah. go back, and the families disappear. What we, what we now normally get is we'll have two weeks of um, uh, people without kids yeah. and older people who are predominantly hikers. Yeah. And the reason we don't think they've arrived today is because the rain is basically raining for the next three days. So yeah. as of Wednesday, we may see an influx of, of people. But mm -hmm. by the middle, let's say the latest, the 20th of September, everything will be over. Hotels will be closed. Some of the bars and restaurants will close and they won't reopen until the week before December. Okay. Now, the run is typically busy in November with ski teacher courses. And we are expecting those ski teacher courses to go ahead. And the one that I work on, I've got around about 450 trainee teachers coming to Caprun. But what we're going to go into, literally in one or two weeks, up until August, so for the remainder of September and all of October, is going to be just like lockdown. Mm. It's going to be like when we locked down on the 15th of March for eight weeks, it was back to uh, Caprun inhabitants only. Yeah, the hotel, some of them, they, well, all of all of the hotels closed, but some of them would have closed then anyway, and they would have definitely closed after Easter. So we're yeah. going back into a lockdown scenario, albeit we're not being told to lock down. So everybody who is here will walk their dog, ride their bike, do their exercise, get ready for the ski season, refurbish their apartments, refurbish their hotels, they'll paint some rooms, they'll wash their car, but they won't do much else. Yeah. And even though a one or two bars will be open, it will only be a pocket of locals that will be in there at any time. Mm -hmm. so, so the chances are the numbers in Austria are going to drop significantly, other than maybe in Vienna, which is a densely populated city, which at the moment has got the biggest number of cases, mm -hmm. over 1,600. But 1,600 in 3.5 million people as a percentage is nothing. Yeah. So I, my, my feeling is we're about, we're about to go into a lockdown scenario again as in the country empties of tourists, we go back to our population of 8 million and yeah. we all go about our daily routine, which is a handful of things getting ready for the ski season. A lot of people will go away on holiday if they can, probably yeah. to other areas of Austria. Come November, influx of people for the ski teacher part, um, ski teacher parties, ski, <laughs> teacher, ski teacher courses. Yeah. Maybe there'll be parties. Um, ski teacher courses. And then, who knows what's going to happen? Will it start to increase again or will it have gone? You know? So again, I think they've got to prepare for a coronavirus season, but will we need the restrictions that they will put in place because the numbers will be so low? Who knows? Yeah. You know, who knows? But I think, I think we, we've recently had a spike because people came back from Croatia. 
Um, a lot of Austrians went to Croatia. They came back. They brought the they brought positive test results. Um, that's why England then went into fourteen day quarantine on return from Austria, Croatia, and Trinidad and Tobago on the same day. Um, but the Austrian figures, even though we've seen an increase again, they're not crazy figures. Um, but I think those figures will start to drop again, literally end of next week, when everybody has left. Interesting times. Yeah, very interesting. But other than that, I've, I've, I've put a couple of posts on it, and maybe we talk on the podcast about it, but other restrictions are going to be masks in gondolas, masks on buses. They're going to speed up the gondolas, surface lifts and chair lifts, no restrictions. Yeah. Um, maybe social distancing in the restaurants. And that seems to be all that they're talking about at the moment. Um, so we, we will wait and see. We will wait and see. Yeah. Cool. All right. Anyway, I don't think we've got anything else that's coming on the side. So I will uh, say thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, thanks for your questions that you pre sent in. And those of you who've been watching live, don't forget if you did watch live, hit the like button. Don't forget to share it with your friends. And thank you, Dave Burroughs from Snow Pros in Switzerland and the Ski Instructor Podcast. Thank you for coming on and giving up your Sunday evening to chat with me and everybody else. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, these are great things that you're doing. So, uh, so yeah, keep up the good work and uh, look forward to seeing who's on um, next Sunday. Yeah, cheers. I will tell everybody that now. We're going to just take you off the screen, Dave, but stay where you are and I will chat to you in a second. And I will just tell everybody. Yeah, so there it is. Dave Burrows from Snow Pros and the Ski Instructor Podcast. Um, next week or the week after, I will have somebody else for you. Don't know who it is yet. But if you have any suggestions of who you would like us to talk to, who you would like us to ask your questions, Mark, Mark Little's probably going to say Josh, Josh Foster, um, then do send them in to me via the Facebook page. Don't forget, you can check the Facebook page daily. I pretty much post every day. I will be doing a couple of morning dog walk lives in the coming days, especially as the snow starts to fall here in Caprone. Other than that, folks, have a fantastic Sunday and a great week wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And we will see you back on the next Ski Instructor, ski instructor Podcast, <laughs> on the next Sunday Ski Cast. And yeah, don't forget to watch out for me on Dave's podcast coming soon. Bye for now. See you all for later. Ciao.